Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Fort Knox. I am here on this lovely Friday with Irving Fain, the founder and CEO of Bowery Farming. Irving, good to see you. Great to see you. So we've actually met before. Not, not everybody who I talk to on Fort Knox have I met before, but I got a chance to check out what you guys are doing. And for the uninitiated, which is going to be a lot of people, first of all, let me let me let me give them a look at some of what you do. This is Bowery Farming's website. What you guys do is indoor farming. So like in a warehouse type setting, stacks of plants grown in a precision way, super clean. I've tasted the food. It's quite good. So th this is a it's a big concept. It's a big idea. Um, and I'm going to start off asking, what is the toughest problem that you guys at Valerie are, are tackling right now? Yeah, you know, it, it's a it's a good question because there's so many tough problems that 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 we are tackling for the reason that you said, which is this is just a it's a big idea and it, it's a complex idea. I think the probably the, the most challenging part of what we're building at Bowery is bringing together what really is a true multidisciplinary set of people on our team all to work on a singular problem. And so what I mean by that is we've got agricultural scientists, you know, PhDs in plant biology and plant physiology and genetics who are working side by side with electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and software engineers and supply chain folks and sales folks. And, People, you know, from all those different disciplines have different backgrounds and experiences and, and, and even vernacular. And so bringing everybody together in an aligned way to focus on and kind of solve the singular problem that we're solving at Bowery, it, it, it's hard, it's challenging, but, it, but it's also what makes what we're doing so energizing, I think, for certainly for me, but also for the people who work at Bowery as well. How has the pandemic and the, the question of reliability of... <laughs> of the the process of getting food, yeah, uh, local food, which which you guys can do because you're close to where people actually are, not way out in the country. How has that changed the landscape for you? We've what we're doing at Bowery today. You know, it is actually no different than what we were doing when you came and visited the farm. You know, long before the pandemic was happening. Right, it's the same value proposition, the same farming method, you know, the same farms. What happened, I think, particularly in March and April, but but certainly has been happening since, is I think a lot of people gained a deeper understanding around our supply chain um, compared to maybe what they knew beforehand. I think you know people in the country uh, were really fortunate. You know, people take for granted the ability to walk into a grocery store and find what they need, whatever they need it. And we're we are really lucky in this country and in many other countries because that that is something a freedom and a luxury that we enjoy, but what's behind that is a very complex supply chain that allows that to happen. And March and April really explode, expose the fragility uh, of our supply chain and how quickly it can become challenged and break and how much our food comes from other parts of the country and even other parts of the world. And the benefit that we can deliver at Bowery really clearly is surety in our supply chain. You know, we are growing food protected produce 365 days of the year, independent of weather and seasonality. So there isn't that disruption. It's a much simpler supply chain because we locate our smart farms close to the cities we're serving. So it's a day or two from when we harvest to when the product gets delivered versus weeks or months of time in the existing agricultural supply chain. And there's a real safety in our supply. You know, we control the entire process from seed to store, as you saw, and that means that we can ensure not only great quality and vibrant flavor and taste, but also a really safe product. And that was important also before the pandemic, but, but certainly now people are thinking more and more about that. Um, tell, me, tell me where you are in terms of where people can buy the product in stores now. So. Um, a lot of people might not know where to find you or have a sense yep. of your reach. Where were you say a year ago? Where are you today? How is the ask that you're getting from your customers different? We, 
we're really fortunate uh, to have been experiencing you know, tremendous momentum even pre-COVID. Certainly this year ha has been a, a big year for us at Bowery. You know, we're, we're really proud now to be the largest indoor vertical farm in the country. And, and we started the year actually in under 100 doors and we are now in over 680 retailers in 680 stores, which, which is, I think, a testament to the quality and the taste of the product itself, but also the importance of the value proposition at Bowery. And, you know, so, so to your question of which stores, you know, we are working with Whole Foods Market. We are working with Stop and Shop. We are working with Giants of Landover. We are working with Weiss Market and we are working with Amazon Fresh and Peapod. Uh, we work with Walmart. So it, it's actually very important to us at Bowery, not only to grow high quality, fresh, tasty food in a more sustainable way, but also to democratize access to high quality fresh food. And so we spend a lot of time ensuring that you can find our product in different types of retailers so different consumers can find it. Hmm. And, and I think the last question you asked, like, how is the ask changing? I think back to what I was saying about the supply chain, like people were interested in quality food and answering the question of where is my food coming from? How was it grown? What was it grown with before COVID happened? I mean, I think there has been a curiosity and a desire for transparency from consumers, certainly over the last decade. That's increased. There was a recent study that said post COVID over 80% of consumers now believe it's extremely important to have transparency and understand where their food's coming from, whether that's because of the safety concern or other reasons. And we have the luxury and the ability to provide really clear understanding of exactly what's happening with our product, how we're growing it and where it's coming from. And that's important, not only to our retail partners, but certainly to the consumers. So you've raised, I believe in investment more than $150 million. Yeah, about 170 that? plus million. 170 plus now. Um, so can, can you, do you give a sense of what that means valuation wise and where's that headed? Are you, are you looking to go public anytime soon? You know, what our focus is right now is, is on continuing to expand and really to, to grow the footprint of Bowery's farms. Um, right now we are in the tri-state area and we recently opened a farm in Maryland that's serving, serving the mid-Atlantic area. And I think what's really con compelling for us is that the problem we're solving is relevant, not only in the tri-state of the mid-Atlantic area, but it's relevant across the US and cities around this country, but it's also relevant and important in cities around the world. And so the focus for us at Bowery is to build farms in every city across this country and cities across the world as well. And we've really focused on building a model from a technology perspective that, that enables that scale. So literally every city across the country, like you're looking at MSAs, you know, metropolitan statistical areas and saying, we got to have an indoor farm in each of these places. We're looking at Chicago, LA, you know, Houston, et cetera, going, going through the markets. Yeah. I think there'll be, you know, there'll probably be cities that make sense to start with. And, you know, we may be able to serve multiple cities, you know, given proximity from single farms, there's no question that this will evolve or our understanding of this will continue to change. Um, but you know, the, the need that we're solving, which is this question of how do you get fresh food to urban environments? How do you do it in a more efficient way? And how do you do it more sustainably is important across this country. There's no question about that. All right. So now let's, uh, let's back up and get a sense of how you got to this point. Um, where'd you grow up? Grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. So oh. not, not the largest state in the country. Let's say that. <laughs> no, definitely not the largest. What did you What did you do growing up in Providence? Uh, man, what didn't I do? I, I I was I was probably a little bit of a troublemaker. I think as an entrepreneur, what I mean by that is uh, as an entrepreneur, you, you you probably are not always set to follow the rules. Um, I in in like I was always, always, always into every kind of hustle I could find myself into. So I think entrepreneurship was in some ways just in my DNA. Um, you know, I was dragging my younger brother around, starting a leaf raking business in the neighborhood, starting snow shoveling businesses. You know, I convinced my parents, was lucky enough to have them buy us a snow blower, which I promised them I would pay off through our, through our earnings once I realized that shoveling snow with a shovel was less efficient than all the people I saw with the snow blowers. And I would fly our neighborhood and, and, and I would get up at five o'clock 
coming since I didn't know if we would have a school, a snow day at school. And I wanted to make sure we could fulfill our, our client expectations and we would go out there every morning. And then I just had a real passion for and drive for building and creating from, from a young age. I mean, one of my early memories is going so wait, to a circle. Ron, yeah. did, did you pay off the snowblower? I did. And, I did. And how long did it take you? God, I don't remember how long it took me, but I'll tell you, snowballing is more uh, is more lucrative than one may imagine. I must say, um, it, it, especially when it snows a lot. Unfortunately, nowadays we are getting a lot less snow in the Northeast. But when I was growing up, it felt like snow was a pretty regular occurrence, and so the, it, it was a good business to be in. I'm not sure that the local landscapers loved us because we were <laughs> currently encroaching on their territory. Um, we we paid it off within the year, though. I'm, I, that much I know. Now nice. that's know, because my parents made it because they said, listen, we'll do this for you, but you owe us, and this is what the payment schedule will look like, and, and we delivered it. It was like our, our first creditor, if you will. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, not <laughs> not exactly venture capital, but like your first creditor. And, yeah, and so yeah. moving on, you were saying uh, how it evolved from there? I would say one of my early memories, even before that, was I, there was a store called Harrison's uh, close by, and I would go down there, and there was a, a these bins of plastic animals, you know, for a dime, you would buy them. And uh, I would go and buy all these animals up and I'd bring them home. I had these Tupperware containers, you know, probably this big. And I would put these little cardboard dividers in and I'd merchandise them up and I would bring them into school and I would sell them for a quarter at, during recess. And so I was doing this really young age until the school found out about it. And the next thing I know, I was in the principal office. My mother actually tells the story um, when she was busy. She was at the school for some reason and she looks over and there I am sitting in the principal's office office and she's like what are you doing in here and i'm in trouble because i was you know running commerce on the uh on the playground which is not something that they were interested in so i i really did have a draw to this from from when i was young you know my dad was an entrepreneur and his father was an entrepreneur so i think you know whether it's in my dna or imprinted or a combination of it all i don't know but it was something i i loved and i've always loved uh, what did your dad and grandfather do entrepreneurially so so my dad was uh on the real estate development side actually even before that he was one of the first people in the country to do live recorded music uh interestingly so he he is just a brilliant engineer as well electrical engineer particularly and he built a recording studio essentially in an 18 foot box truck um, and he did it when he was in college and he would drive around and he recorded people like the Rolling Stones, the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, the Eagles, because at that time there was no notion of live recording. Um, and so that was how he started off. And it was just like the original true hustle, which it was just a pretty cool story. Uh, one of my early, early, early memories as a kid is sitting in the back of that recording truck eating goldfish and just kind of watching. <laughs> um, and, and then he turned uh, into real estate development and he worked in, in real estate. Um, and my grandfather before him was he, he had a retail business that he was involved in. He actually did a lot of import export, you know, you know, long before travel was as easy as it was today. And he also actually was, was really involved in the civil rights movement. He was a close friend of Martin Luther King and he was one of the architects of the first fair housing laws in the U S um, and he really fought hard for a lot of these social issues and racial justice issues. I think that also kind of forms for me a backdrop of, civic duty and civic entrepreneurship as well. And, and so, you know, one of the big developments that he had worked on in Rhode Island was one of these first developments that was underneath the fair housing law. And it was really important to him that it was access to the housing was accessible by anyone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, it's hard to know why you end up where you do in life, but I, but I, but I think that that influence, I mean, I remember growing up, people coming up to me constantly and just telling me, and I'm actually named after my grandfather, and, and he he sadly died you know, long before I was born and when my dad was young, you know, in his early 20s, and so I never met him. But all growing up, people would come up to me and say, you know, your grandfather was an incredible person. He did amazing things, and you know, he was the man of the year from the NAACP and a bunch of these other organizations. And I think uh, th that, that clearly has to leave a mark on you in some way and imprint something on you. Yeah, that's a... That's a great story and a powerful legacy. Uh, I, I want to dip back into the music thing that you were saying, you know, yeah. your dad being a, an, an engineer in that sense and pioneering in that because you seem to have had an interest in music too. Is that where it came from? Love music. I've loved music since I was 
young as I can remember. And I love DJing and like being a part of the music, you know, kind of being a part of music. I remember, you know, forcing my parents and their friends when they were over, I would hook up the speakers in the living room to a wire and I would wind the wire to another room and connect it to a stereo and I would DJ their party, which was probably a terrible experience for them, but great fun for me. Um, and I, I, you know, I, after working for a couple of years, like I knew I wanted to go back to music. And so I, I never played an instrument, which is something I really regret, but I, I was a DJ growing up and all through college and, and I wanted music to be an important part of my life for a while. And, and that probably again, goes back to an imprint from when I was young because it was a, a part of the earliest days that I remember. Sound like a fun guy. I mean, between <laughs> between the businesses sprouting up, saying that you're not into following rules and uh, and lots of DJing, um, you know, uh, I'm sure there's there's lots of stories in there. So t take me through college and and into what you end up doing. Yeah, kind of leading up to to iHeartRadio. Yeah, you know, for sure. Where you did some work. So, so I, I went to school and got a like a true liberal arts education um and and you know where i went there was not much of a an entrepreneurship focus at that time so the ability to learn you know entrepreneurship or, or business wasn't really there and I'm, I'm not sure one can learn that from school anyways at this point but that's a whole other conversation um and so i graduated and sort of like a naive 21 year old kid i said to myself well okay well how do i go learn business and so I, of course i say oh well investment banking, you know, banking in the Wall Street must be a great place. And so I, uh, I went and worked uh, as an investment banker. But what I did do was I wanted to make sure that I was working with the kind of companies I wanted to be a part of. So instead of doing, you know, multi-billion dollar bond offerings for, you know, Hertz or companies like that, I wanted to work with earlier stage businesses. So I helped companies that were raising later stage capital, maybe Series D, Series E, things like that. And I was doing that in gaining institutional knowledge from the bank. But at the same point, I was working with closely with management teams, watching the capital raising process and sort of felt like I was closer to the world that I ultimately wanted to be a part of. And I did that for a few years and I, I did, I gained a lot and learned a lot. A lot of times people say to me now, like, oh man, you probably wish you, you had done that. And, you know, don't you wish you just dove into building something? And I actually think every part of my career, my history is a building block to where I am today. And, and I appreciate each of the experiences I've had. And, and you know, I, I learned a lot from that that I actually draw on from Bowery today. And For example? Just understanding capitalization and capital structures, you know, at, you know, at Bowery particularly, you know, we're building farms. And so thinking about how we structure, you know, the, the financings around those farms and how we think about our balance sheet and how we think about raising capital, it's particularly important in a business like ours. And you know, I spent a lot of time learning about and understanding that, you know, in that time as a banker. And I didn't necessarily draw on it in my last company, though, though I did some of it. I mean, part of banking as well is just, you know, wrote learning and understanding financial statements and income statements and balance sheets and cash flows and how they all tie together and work together. And, you know, in a, in a business like ours that, that it does have complexity in its financials, like that knowledge plays into what I do each day as well. Okay. And so you end up eventually though at iHeartRadio? Yeah. So I, I, I decided that Wall Street was not my destiny. Um, and so I, I shook hands, parted ways with a good experience. And I spent a little bit of time actually doing some venture investing with a couple of people who were looking to get a fund off the ground. And you know, it was interesting, but wasn't where I wanted to spend time then. And so I, I, I wanted to start jumping into the operating side. And, and at this point in New York City, the, the technology scene was, was far from what it is today. I mean, it was kind of seamless web, double click, and a, and a little bit else, but not a lot. So we're and, talking early 2000s then? What? Yeah, early 2000s, exactly. So it was kind of post-dot-com crash. Wasn't a lot happening here still in technology. Uh, and I got in touch with and ended up working at Clear Channel. And I was part of a, a really small team at the time. You know, for those that don't know, Clear Channel is the, the largest radio group in the world. Uh, and our group was responsible for figuring out what was digital going to mean for this old school radio company. How are they going to move into the digital age? And I mean, we were talking about streaming radio on websites at that point. I mean, we were still <laughs> figuring that out. This was when MySpace was still very much around and abundant and when Facebook had just a page and not a newsfeed. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if you remember widgets, I don't know if you remember this, we were like widgetizing our content so you could share a button. This was, that was where we were first. And but what was so exciting about it is the digital world was changing incredibly quickly. And while I was there, the iPhone gets released and this notion of the app store emerges, which nobody had really understood what it was going to be or could be. And that set the stage for a few of us to say, hey, there's a real opportunity. We have you know, 800 plus stations across the country. We have incredible access to content. What can we do with that? And there was born iHeartRadio. Hmm. And so I helped to build and launch and run iHeartRadio for a, a period of time, which was a, a really fun and interesting and exciting experience. What part of the building of it were you hands on with and how much of it had to do with that experience that you had gotten already in finance? I would say the finance piece of it was not closely tied into tie to art really but it was i mean i was helping to think about the product we were thinking about the distribution strategy we were thinking about the content strategy i mean it was a small group of us so we were figuring out how is this going to work and there was a real question because a number of people internally at that time said i don't understand why would somebody in los angeles care about listening to a radio station in new york or why would somebody in houston want to listen to a chicago station and there was skepticism about this idea and we really were evangelizing internally as much as, as anything else, that this was a, an initiative that mattered and was valuable. And, and I also ran the content team. So I was spending a lot of time talking to content providers, you know, labels and management companies, talking to them about the ability to give us content that we could then distribute through this app. And we had a lot of influence in the industry because Clear Channel's reach was so far that artists wanted to work with us at that time because we, we could enable them to get in front of a lot of people quickly. You know, it was sort of a one-stop shop for pretty broad distribution. And that was a real advantage for us. And, and this app platform was brand new. And I don't know, you remember this, everybody was building an app at that time. You know, everyone had an app and you quickly realized that no one was going to have 600 apps on their phone, which I think we know <laughs> now. And, and iHeart had a good position because you know your local radio station and you care about your local radio stations and that's something you want to have on your phone, same way you want the weather on your phone and you want the news on your phone. And you know, I, I cannot claim credit for what they've turned iHeart into. It's I sometimes smile when I think about they named the whole company after iHeart now. And you know, the team just did an extraordinary job taking that forward, building it and creating, you know, an amazing product that has just an extraordinary reach now as well. So far, nothing that you've said or talked about from the snow blowing to the, the DJing to the finance to iHeart has anything to do with food, agriculture, like <laughs> Where where does where does Bowery come in? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great it's a it's a great question, and and what I would tell you, in credit to my mother, she was she was ahead of the curve because we were uh, we were eating quality food, and she cared about what we ate when I was as young as I can remember, and she. You know, she first of all, she's an extraordinary cook, and but she valued fresh food and fresh vegetables. We were lucky to have access to that kind of food. And one of the things that's great about Rhode Island is it's so small, so you're not very far away from fresh seafood or fresh farms, and so you have access to all of these places. And so, you know, I grew up with my mother not only cooking phenomenal meals for us every day but thinking a lot about the ingredients we were eating and the importance of local food and the importance of quality food and how that mattered for your health. And I realized I'm lucky in a way a lot of people weren't. And I also, because I experienced that growing up, I think I watched over the last couple of decades, the world change and the access to that type of food get harder and harder, even in these last couple of decades for no matter who you are just because the system itself has changed. And so that really was a part of who I was growing up. Now, I was not a long-term farmer, of course. I, we, we had a garden, but, but I would not tell you I was an expert farmer or an expert gardener in any way. I like to be outside like anyone else, but my real exposure to food was, was through my mother and just through growing up and, and having those home-cooked meals every night with our family. Okay, so then how does Bowery start? Yeah, so there was an in-between in Bowery, which is I actually left iHeart to start a different company. And, and I started an enterprise software business. The company was called CrowdTwist. And it, we, we had a loyalty and analytics platform that we worked with big Fortune 500. So L'Oreal, and Procter and & Gamble, and Nestle, and Pepsi, folks like that. are So CPG and retail and, and financial services companies. 
And we built the company up over six years and we raised about 20, 25 million in venture capital over that time. And, and you know, what happened for me personally, John, was I, first of all, just sort of looked out and said, hey, you know, I'm not sure I want to spend the next six, six to 10 years of my life working in this space necessarily. I had a lot of fun, a lot of energy building this um, and building a company. But I think one thing I've learned from that experience is not just about the building itself, but it's very much important to know what you're building and making sure you have a passion for that. Mm -hmm. And the second piece of it is I just, I really wanted to work on a problem that I know not only had personal passion for, but I felt was solving a broad societal issue as well. Uh, since I was young, I've just believed technology can solve hard and important problems. And I wanted to spend my time doing that. And so you look at, at agriculture and you quickly see that it is at the epicenter, whether directly or indirectly, of so many of the global issues that we face today, um, you know, whether so it's health. Maybe well. a little bit of that Irving Fain name, your your uh, your grandfather's legacy calling on you a bit? Yeah, I think I, I, I do think that. I think that I think when you put business and social good together and you create an economic engine, which in and of itself is driving positive social change, you can actually exponentially incre increase the impact that you can make. And I really saw the agricultural system as a place where, where I could do that. You know, it's, it's, it's the greatest consumer of resources globally by a huge margin. 70% of our water worldwide goes to agriculture every year, which is astounding. We, we put a billion pounds of pesticides down each year in the US and about 6 billion pounds every year across the globe. And wow. you know, it's, it's in our soil and it's hurting our ability to grow vibrant food moving forward. It's in our water, it's on the food we're eating. And just in the last 40 years, we've lost 30% of all of our arable farmland. So you have a system that's just stretching and straining. And look look now, you've got fires and droughts. And so the, the system needs to change. And then you look at what's happening to the population. Nine to 10 right. billion people in the next 30 years. We need 50 to 70% more food, according to the UN. And what drove me to Bowery was all that change is happening while 70 to 80% of people are urbanizing. They're going to be living in and around cities in this next period of time. And so I got obsessed with that question of how do you get fresh food to our urban environments and how do you do it more efficiently and how do you do it more sustainably? Okay. Okay. So I, I like to ask about the, the lowest point and it can be career. It can be life outside of career that ends up uh, affecting your entire outlook. But has there been a moment where things were going so wrong that you thought maybe this entire outlook that I've had on career or what I thought I was going to do or what I thought I was capable of uh, was wrong and, and I need to try something else? You know, I think if I think about the time post crowd twist and pre Bowery, I don't know that it was like Death Valley as you have up there, but it was definitely this point of like, wow, you know, I, I was building this company and it, we've been doing well and we had revenue and we had customers and good investors and and great clients. And, and now here I am sort of back to nothing with nothing. And you very quickly realize how far you've come even in that journey over the course of six years and, and how much you've gained and how much foundation is under you in a company like I had at CrowdTwist. And you remember acutely what you've forgotten about how much effort and energy and time it takes to build that foundation back up when you're sitting sort of back at the base with no foundation again. Now, what, and, what happened? Why were you back at the base with no foundation? Yeah, well, because you, I didn't have a company, right? I was, I was, you know, back on my own thinking about what was I going to do next, right? So what, so what happened I, to the company? What was the what was well? The so the great thing is, in the end, we ended up selling CrowdTwist to Oracle uh, for over a hundred million dollars. So it was, a, it was a great outcome for us. Yes, yeah, so, and and even more importantly, I think is the product is being used actively and being sold actively. And so, I, what what makes me really proud is is that legacy continues. It's not one of these products that somebody buys and you sort of don't hear it from again. It, it is an important part of what Oracle is, is, is selling in their, their CRM platform. And so I think it, I have a lot of pride and I hope the team has a lot of pride that we built something that, that makes sense for that industry and, and that world. And I think that's really valuable. Um, but 
I didn't have an agricultural background, right? I didn't have an agricultural network. I didn't have an agricultural foundation. And and it, it, to, to the question you're asking, a lot of people said, go build another software as a service company. Like, you know that, you have never understand that industry. And, and as much as I knew that was a path that made sense for me, maybe, maybe the path of least resistance, it wasn't the path that I felt made the most sense for me. And it wasn't hitting on the things that I cared about, as I said. And in spite of the fact that I didn't have that foundation, I think I was interested and excited and willing to say, I want to rebuild this. And I want, I want to rebuild this in a new industry and in a new place where I hadn't been before. And that, that was a hard decision. And that was a... It was a difficult time because there was no guarantee that I would even be able to do it. Could I build a network? Did I understand it? Was there a real opportunity? Was this even going to work? Was I was I going to find that getting to where I'd gotten before was much harder to, to repeat? And I just all those were questions. All those questions were unknown. Did the exit that you had had make make it harder to hustle? I mean, because so, I assume if, if it went well, right, then you you got some money out of selling yeah. to Oracle for $100 million. You didn't have to go to your parents to pay for the snowblower anymore to, to turn that into a metaphor. Did, did that make it harder to hustle or no? Well, so the interesting thing is the company didn't sell until after I'd started Bowery. So I stayed on the board of CrowdTwist and I stayed involved. So the company was still a going concern. I was still involved. I was still working with the team, you know, helping out and sort of transitioning out. Um, so I didn't have that like, you know, windfall of capital that came in. And so, no, I did. So I, I was, I was still borrowing against the snowblower, if you will. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you, you were still doing that. Um, what, what then was there a core belief that came out of that? I've done all this, but it feels like it doesn't matter as much as I want it to. Was it what was it that that motivated you? That pushed you? Was there a moment? Was there an aha to go into this particular effort where maybe you don't have the background, but you believe you can build it? Interestingly, I was wary of exactly what you're asking about, and what I mean is my most important barometer as I evaluated what I did next was time. And what I mean by that is I've seen many people sort of follow this excitement curve and then start their business and then it goes, whoosh, falls off, right? Or it kind of comes up and then it plateaus or it comes up and it slowly declines. And 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 once you start something, you're, you're in it. You're in it for a long time. And so I, I learned that lesson and, and I wanted to work on something that I knew was going to go the distance for me. It was going to sustain the test of time and that the curve was going to go like this. And my interest was only going to increase. And so I actually forced myself to be patient and to wait and to not act on an aha moment or act on a great conversation or an exciting insight alone, but to build and even you know, I, I had many conversations. I looked at many different industries. I looked at many different opportunities. Even once I felt that Bowery was the thing I wanted to do, I really wanted to ensure that it really was going to stand the months and months and months of tests as I kept digging in and I kept working. And what I found was, at, like other ideas that it sort of rose and fall for me, Bowery just kept growing and I just kept coming back to it. I kept becoming excited about it. More and more of my time kept being devoted to this problem. And there just came a point for me when I said, you know what? Like, I don't want to focus on anyone, anything else. This is what I want to do. This is a big idea, as you said in the beginning. It's a hard idea, but it is a meaningful and important problem to solve. And this is something that I can be proud of. And this is something I can make my life's work on. There's a lot of intricate pieces to this and how it works. And for someone who didn't have a background in agriculture, what was the process? How did you um, gather the expertise? How did the, the process develop? How did the technology develop to support it? Yeah, I think one of your most important jobs as a founder is to early on first identify the most important components of your business to succeed at that stage and then to take an honest self-assessment and recognize where you have strengths that also overlap with those core competencies or with those core components and then you need to go find people who have strengths in those important areas where you don't overlap and 
you know, I worked on my own for as long as I could try to understand and learn and teach myself as much as I could about this, about agriculture in general. I mean, John, I read every USDA report you can imagine. I talked to everyone I could. I met with anyone who would meet with me, you know, really diligently, but I'm not an agricultural scientist and that's pretty important with what we're doing at Bowery. So we went and found someone who had experience there and I'm not a mechanical engineer and we found someone there. And, and I built up a small group of us who, really worked together. And one of the most important things we did as well was we we approached the problem from a first principle standpoint. And what I mean is I knew that the problem was real, but I didn't know how to solve it. And I even didn't know if it could be solved in a scalable way. And so we set out to basically test and learn and understand the landscape around urban agriculture. And we looked at greenhouses and we looked at aeroponics and aquaponics and vertical hydroponics and container farming. And we looked at every possible method of doing this. And I was wide open to the answer being, hey, there just isn't a good answer. And, mm. and that was okay with me because I think one of the most important decisions we all make is where and how to spend our time. And I didn't want to put my time into something that I thought wasn't going to work. How was how was this exploration funded? <laughs> because you said you you left your previous company yeah, before yeah, yeah. its exit. Yep. You must have had some investors or somebody who who were doing that whole bet on the entrepreneur, not on the idea thing. Because it seems like you didn't have the idea fully formed yet, but you were Correct. able to gather people and get the idea. What what did you line up to even have that freedom? Yeah. Well, interestingly, like I had, a, it's because I've been in the industry for a while. I had a number of people who said, let us write you a seed check and, and we'll help you get started. And I actually, I didn't take that money because I felt that the idea at the time was just so zany. It's just crazy. I remember going to my wife and saying, Hey, so I'm going to build these farms and warehouses. I mean, she's like, what? You know, it just it doesn't sound very reasonable. And, and I didn't want to take people's money for what just felt like a science experiment. And so what I did was, you know, I worked on my own for a while and I was fortunate. I had, had some savings that I that I had saved up and then I was able to put some money forward where we needed to put some money, but was able to also have other people who were working on their own. And some of them worked while I had other jobs. So they were working nights and they were working weekends to do this experimentation, to do the analysis, to, to really test and understand and learn. And so part of it was just convincing other people to believe also in what I was believing in. And fortunately, all of us really had a passion and a belief that this could exist and that this should exist and that there was a solution that that made sense in this world. And we were all dead set on going out and finding it. And I think it wasn't just my passion, it was all of our passion collectively. And I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that, that everybody was willing to say, hey, listen, I'm gonna put my extra time and effort in. And we did that, but we hit a point, John, where we found the system that we believed was the best answer, was the most efficient way of doing this, was viable. And then it became clear that we were hitting diminishing returns. Another six months of research and testing wasn't gonna yield six months of value. And that was when it was time to raise money and start to build a farm and start to move forward. Okay. Um, we're, we're looking right now again at, at some of the, the process and what your facilities look like. Uh, what's at Bowery been your best failure? The thing that you thought was going to work, but it didn't and ended up teaching you a lot in the process. We are littered with those <laughs> and we are. And thank God we are. I, I'm thankful for that because if we weren't, if I couldn't sit here to, and tell you that we have an enormous number of those, then we wouldn't be trying and taking risks and pushing the boundaries the way we need to be. You know, we are really working on a frontier problem that you know nobody's really done what we're doing, right? This is a brand new industry and a brand new opportunity. And so there's a lot of experimentation that comes with that and experimentation is gonna lead to success and experimentation is gonna lead to failure. So, you know, there are aspects of our system, for instance, that we've built that just didn't work. Didn't work the way we expected. Didn't work the way we wanted to. I mean, you know, we used to seed all our crops by hand. Uh, that worked for a while. You can imagine that's not very uh, efficient, and it certainly does isn't going to. Really yeah, the yeah, seeds aren't very large. You saw our automatic seeder <laughs> there before. I, you know, we, we and it was only through building and trying certain things, some that worked 
brilliantly and better than we imagined and others that, that, that maybe failed spectacularly that has gotten to us today. And by the way, we'll continue to have failures this year and next year and the year after that. And I think the moment where we stop having failures of some sort is probably the moment I need to retire because we're, we're no longer pushing to, to reinvent and reimagine. But what's the best one? <laughs> it can't be that it can't be the seeds. What's the yeah, best no. that, that either that biggest bet or that that most illuminating miscalculation? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about one of our biggest pieces. You know, I, I think that we well, not going into too much detail, but in one of the farms that we built, uh, not our first, we in our second farm, um, we underestimated the importance and the complexity of what happens to our crops after they're grown. And because we control the entire process from seed to store, the growing is as important, or rather the processing, you know, the harvesting and the packaging and the shipping is as important as the growing part of it is. And that's what makes our business so interesting and exciting and but complex. I mean, we are reimagining the supply chain. I mean, that is really what we're doing at Power. We are rebuilding the supply chain in a more sustainable and efficient way. And so that means the post-growing part is a really important component of that effort. And I think we had underestimated the necessity and the complexity that was involved there and we sort of underbuilt that component of our farm and and just didn't realize it until we started running the farm and all of a sudden you sort of pick up and say whoa we are we are not prepared for 30 times the volume coming out of this farm um in, in terms of what to do and how to handle it and we've adjusted and we've evolved and we've not only learned in that farm but in many ways i mean that sowed the seed for the so extraordinary innovation. I mean, there's so many ag puns, by the way. But that is what you learn when you work in agriculture. They just they just keep go they just keep growing, um, and uh, we it sowed the seed for the extraordinary innovation that the team has has, has created and what they've built in our newest farm in Maryland. It, it came from that 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 miscalculation in that second farm, and and we corrected it in the second farm to some extent, and then we completely innovated in our third farm, and had we not really kind of missed it that big, we probably wouldn't have figured it out that way. So tell me what, what you changed in process, in communication, what were the changes that you made as a result of that, that are benefiting you now? Uh, substantially more automation, substantially more technology, uh, substantially more integration of we have what's called the Bowery operating system. And the, the Bowery operating system is the central nervous system of our entire business, including of our farms. And it collects millions of data points across processing and growing, and it optimizes the conditions for our crops, but also the process itself. And we have much more deeply integrated the Bowery operating system into all parts of our process, not just the agricultural component, but the processing room and, and everything that we do from seeding to harvesting to packaging. And it, it, it underlies everything that we do alongside a substantial amount of new and sophisticated automation that the team has developed and designed. And all of that, again, comes from what we didn't have before. I mean, it's, it's, you look at the newest farm and, and the one before and you say, wow, like, what a step forward. Huh. Okay. So what is going to determine between what you guys are doing now and what competitors are doing? Because there are other people, other companies that have, um, you know, methods that are at least along the same lines, not exactly the same. What do you think is going to determine who comes out ahead? who who leads in this space is it um is it a funding issue at this point is it the right partners is it the technology uh what what's playing the biggest role yeah i think th there's so much that matters right now john there's no question about that you know we are really fortunate to work with some of the the best investment partners that, that we could ask for you know uh, whether it be Google Ventures or Tomasic, you know, Tomasic is, is one of the preeminent agricultural investors around the world, uh, you know, first round capital, general catalyst, GGV capital. I mean, 
not only deep pocketed investors, but but really thoughtful and experienced investors in this category, in this space, and in, in building and expanding, you know, great companies. Um, that's important. Um, I mentioned earlier, but we are we're really proud that we are we are now the largest indoor vertical farm in the country and, you know we are in over 680 stores and that number is expanding and we have great commercial relationships with our partners whether it be whole foods or Ah hold and you know walmart and these other companies and so those relationships are important and will continue to be important for us um but you know i, I do think at the end of the day you know the technology and the systems themselves are incredibly important because they dictate the ability to grow different crops. They dictate the ability to continue to grow high quality produce reliably, consistently year round. And you know, I would almost wind all the way back to when we started, where we said, listen, let's be agnostic to the solution. Let's believe in the problem, but not the solution. And it was that sort of openness to any answer being the right answer that led us to the systems that we have today at Bowery and led us to the approach that we have where we focus on automation and robotics inside of our farms. We focus on sensor and control systems that we develop on the operating system, which is a combination of software and artificial intelligence and computer vision that we're creating. And the, the, the combination and, and, and all of those working together in an ecosystem, that is, is extraordinarily powerful in terms of, of producing a scalable, stable base for us to build this business forward across the country and across the world. And we've worked really hard and been thoughtful in the way we've scaled the company in the last five years to put us in a position to really begin to expand even more quickly. Well, I encourage everybody to go try it. It was it was eye-opening for me. The I mean, the first time that I got to taste what you guys have coming out of these indoor farming facilities. Uh, I haven't thought about produce quite the same way since. So uh, Irving, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to, to give this chat and give us a sense of not only what Bowery has been working on, but your path through snow blowing <laughs> and, uh, and DJing and finance and digital commerce. Um, all the way through to here. John, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun just uh, winding back the clock for myself as well. So thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And everybody, uh, we'll see you next week at the CEO of Informatica coming up and also the CEO of BMC Software as well. So um, keep it moving. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody.